Hey everyone, and welcome to another Kanoa Reviews, where we review games both new and old on all platforms. If you like the content that I make, then please subscribe to the channel and click the notification bell so you never miss a review when it comes out. Today we talk about Silent Hill 4, the fourth installment in the Silent Hill series and the most divisive one in those first four games. There's a lot of people who dislike this game or think it's way worse than Silent Hill 1, 2, and 3. I already knew this going in, and I remember many reviews from back in the day giving it around a 7, which was a stark contrast against all the 9s that Silent Hill 2 and 3 received. Though I'd never played Silent Hill 4 The Room, I did already know a few things going in, like that part of the game would be in first person, and that the other parts would be in your more traditional third person gameplay. Now ironically, I was actually really looking forward to playing this, because despite all the criticism I heard about this game, the premise seemed really interesting, and the visuals that the game brought to life, like the iconic door with the locks and chains, just looked really incredible. So I actually thought before playing that I might like it actually a bit more than the average player, but soon after starting it, I noticed that I might have spoken too soon. Silent Hill 4 attempts to introduce a lot of new gameplay and ideas, and the developers should be praised for doing this. But rarely have I seen a game where almost all of these new ideas or systems miss their mark completely. People who defend this game say it simply gets hate for it being different from the first three games. But I don't think that's true, because if you look closer at some choices that were made, it simply does not work as well. Now there are definitely some things to be enjoyed here, and I will speak about those too of course. Let's take a deep dive in this turmoil nightmare of a game. First, let's talk about the story and premise. You wake up from a nightmare as Henry Townsend and find that you are stuck in your apartment with no way of getting out as your front door is locked and chained. The initial five minutes of the game are really cool and atmospheric. I love these first person sections and honestly, the short times you return to the room are the best moments of the game and I honestly wish that the creators had done more with this. The apartment is beautifully detailed, and for a PlayStation 2 game, the graphics are quite good. Character models outside look absolutely atrocious though, but it does feel bustling with life and atmospheric. You can move to four different rooms in your apartment. The bedroom, the bathroom, the washing room, and the living room slash kitchen. You can interact with various things like the windows and look outside to see that for the rest of the apartment's inhabitants, everything is normal. This tiny mechanic of looking out of the window and seeing normal life pass you by is actually really neat and atmospheric. I really like this, and it's also utilized well with a puzzle where you need to find out a code from a billboard you can only see from your window. You can also look outside your front door and see other inhabitants walk by, talk to each other, or doing chores. Now soon after you've come to realize that you cannot go anywhere, you stumble on a hole in your wall which you crawl through and it has you teleported to the nearby subway. This is where the gameplay shifts and you control Henry in third person. Literally within 5 minutes of playing this, I knew that this was going to be a bad experience. Henry controls incredibly bad. He controls even more robotic than James and Heather, despite this game not having tank controls, and the combat mechanics are absolutely horrifying. I mean, you can actively see how bad he controls purely by his movement and his running animation. But then again, with the other Silent Hill games, you were more often than not expected to run away or avoid monsters if they were out in the open, so by then, I still expected that to be the case here too. You soon meet a busty woman named Cynthia, who is seemingly a bit too impressed with the emotionless and badly voiced Henry. Uh, believe me, we will talk about that in a little bit. And she thinks that you two are stuck in her dream and need to get out of there. So you follow her around as she disappears in the bathroom, after which you will be attacked by a bunch of weird looking dogs. Now purely by visual design, I have to say that they do look pretty cool with grotesque tongues, which they can stab enemies with to drink their fluids. But this is where I notice that the combat in this game is absolutely atrocious and even worse than in the previous games. Henry's fighting animations are incredibly stiff and clunky. The animation is by far worse than Heather's combat animation in Silent Hill 3, and it honestly feels and looks super boring and cheap. In a way, it can be compared to Silent Hill 2, which, though I adore that game, I did, validly so, criticize its horrible combat. But the thing is that with that game, the creatures in a way are animated to compensate for this crappy combat system by you being able to outrun and avoid combat. 
in Silent Hill 4, running will often do more harm than fighting because so many of the enemies are so fast that even if you run at full speed, they will have no problem gaining on you. So in a way, it's better to fight because often the enemies do not respawn and it's safer to clear out a room instead of running through it and getting attacked two or three times because the enemies are just that damn annoying or fast. And so you fight them with those horrible controls and fighting mechanics. It's also here too where I noticed how the sound design is very lackluster as well, with so many stock sounds being used. Whenever the dogs die, you hear this standard sounding feline sound, which just sounds really ridiculous and cheap. I'm also so tired of people giving the crappy fighting mechanics a pass, because the main character in these horror games is not supposed to be a soldier or knows how to fight properly. Again, they already improved upon this with Silent Hill 3, and though animations were more fluid, realistic, and better, you still did not have the feeling that you were a martial artist or a tank, and still rather would run away from the enemies, since they were overall just so threatening. That is what you want. To feel threatened, but if push comes to shove, where you are cornered and need to fight them off, you want a fighting system that at least feels like it's not clunky or stiff. We will come back to this stupid fighting system more throughout the review as we talk about more incoming enemies. But for now, we are back at the subway and we are separated from Cynthia and thus we walk around a bit, attempt to fight, get damaged, run around and then find an item. Ah, some ammo! That means hopefully we will find a pistol very soon. So you head on over to the ammo and want to pick it up, but I'm being chased by dogs so I do what I always do and I serpentine and head towards the ammo and tap the grab button to go and get it. And I do so but nothing happens. Wait, what? And so what happens in this game is whenever you pick something up, the game asks you if you want to pick up the item and automatically has its cursor set to no. So if you spam the button, like I did because I was being chased, you basically tell the game that you do not want to pick up the item. Having now this system where the game asks you each time you want to pick up an item is annoying, especially if you're being chased. But does the game have a reason to do this? It does indeed, but that also leads to another terrible choice that was made with this game that does not work at all. See, in this game you have a limited inventory system. You can only hold 10 items at once, and if you want to keep more, you will have to deposit them in an item box you keep in your room whenever you are there. Now on paper alone, a limited inventory system is not bad, especially since games like Resident Evil have it, and I love the first two games and think it works really well there. But one of the dumbest things in this game is that each ammo pack you pick up takes up one separate item slot in your inventory. You receive them in packs of 10 bullets per pack, and so if you find 40 bullets in a level, they will take up 4 of your 10 inventory slots, plus of course, the pistol itself making it 5. There goes half your inventory. The issue with this system is that the third person sections are not altered to cater to the system's playstyle. You will find candles which have a certain function, medallions that have a certain function, puzzle items, weapons that you can use, weapons another character can use, medicine item that you can use, and you simply do not have enough space to carry all this with you. Now this is of course done on purpose, and again on paper, there's nothing wrong with this since it gives you the dilemma of making tough choices and only taking the items you really need with you. That's what of course you have with Resident Evil, it can only carry 6 items or something, and so you have your gun, some ammo, 2 healing items, a puzzle item, and maybe one more free slot for if you find something. But the amount of items you find there, that have a good use or a unique use, is way more limited compared to the room and therefore is more manageable. In here, it's super tedious to many times go back to your room, deposit swords, candles, medicine, ammo, weapons like golf clubs, and more, to pick up more stuff in the levels. And you can of course leave them alone if you want, the choice is yours, but the game really punishes you for not carrying or picking up certain weapons like the medallions or the candles or those swords. It is because you have such a limited inventory that the game asks you every time if you want to pick up an item or not, because you cannot discard them and are stuck with the item in the inventory until you are back in your room. It's an awful system and one we have seen working in other games, but not well implemented in this title. Again, props for them trying something different, but it just doesn't work well. So in this section, if you go after Cynthia in the bathroom, you find another hole in the wall and through these holes you can keep going back and forth to your room and the level you are at. They can be compared to save points because in the room you can always save and you also will automatically heal while you are in the room, at least for the first half of the game. 
This is also why combat in the beginning is a bit more encouraged since you can heal automatically while being back in your room. Once more, it's these short parts where you're in the room that the game works and that it shines, but all these moments are so brief and short, it truly pains me that they did not focus and do more with this. Often when you come back to your room, something is different in your room than it was before, and as you progress through the game, crazier and crazier things start to happen. One of the first things you notice is a small cupboard being moved, revealing a hole you can peep through to spy on your neighbor Eileen, who seemingly is not aware from anything bad happening in the room next to her. Looking through windows or holes is something you will do multiple times here in this game, but you never really get an expected jump scare. The maybe creepiest thing that happened to me is the stuffed bunny turning around to face me whenever Eileen was not home, as if it knew I was spying on her. They do the predictable scare of you peeping through the small hole in your front door, but it's not as effective scare since it's simply zombie Henry standing there. And let's also now talk a bit about Henry, because it's impressive how little effort went into making him a good protagonist. Now I get that he is sort of the fish out of water type character, not really knowing what's going on and piecing the pieces together as things unfollow, just like the player is. Both James and Heather had a clear motivation why they were doing what they were doing and going where they were going. But with Henry, that simply is not the case. But what makes it even worse is Henry's horrible voice acting. I'm now, after playing multiple Silent Hill games, convinced that some people over there at Team Silent just do not have a good ear for voice acting. With Silent Hill 3, they improved a bit on it compared to Part 2, and even in Silent Hill 4, you do still have some pretty decent voice actors like Eileen. But Henry is just lacking emotion all the time, and is talking in this quiet, monotone voice that is just absolutely astounding on how little effort is being put into it. Now for a moment, let's get back to something positive, shall we? And that is of course always has to do with the moments where you are in first person in the room itself. Often whenever you get back, you can find hidden notes shoved under the door or closet. These will slowly tell and explain more of the story and are written quite well. I managed to retrieve all notes but two, so it wasn't too difficult to get the gist of it and more background lore on that. You initially also are expected to return to your room briefly, as you will then receive an item when you return in the subway which will let you pass through the ticket gate. Now this moment where you come back is one of the two times where the game freaked me out, as there was suddenly a mannequin sitting on the toilet, whereas there was no one before. The mannequin holds the item I talked about just now, and so you can proceed and head towards the actual subway platforms. It's here where you are introduced to another new enemy type, and another reason why this game misses its mark. So for the first time, the game introduces ghosts in a more classic form like you and me know them. These ghosts slowly come out of the walls and then fly over to come and haunt you. They will try to punch you, but what's worse is that them only being near you is enough to damage you. You are unable to kill them, so your instinct again is to just run from them. But they are faster than you are, and so running yet again results in you getting damaged. The ghosts themselves are also not scary or creepy at all. Their designs are terrible. They just are your simple, regular looking people, but then they are flying. Some are even wearing dorky looking hats, or the other is wearing a unbuttoned dungarees. If anything, they are annoying rather than scary, because they are so fast and damage you by only being near you. Having these ghosts as a recurring theme and enemy in this game is another horrible idea and implementation. There's nothing scary about their looks, nothing scary about their movements, and the sound, though initially unsettling, just cannot weigh up against how much of a nuisance they are. Silent Hill did not need ghosts among their enemies, and still does not need it in my opinion. And so in this level, you go through the various trains on the track and eventually head towards an escalator for another section that just is so incredibly tedious. Even more so because it's repeated more than once. This escalator section has you run up or down while enemies attack you from the wall. You have to time your movements, but the hitboxes are sometimes really finicky. It also goes on forever, and just looks super boring and tedious. It's also here where I saw that some people who defend this game say that the game is not supposed to be fun like other games. Even some pretentious people out there compare it to how something like Schindler's List is not supposed to be fun and compares it to this experience. That is just incredibly 
dumb in my opinion because comparing theme tone or story from a movie is not the same as comparing not having a good time because of the game mechanics if it was purely about story narration or themes of the game it could be a comparison that had more leadway but sometimes it's kind of impressive how far and ludicrous the arguments go for those who defend the game now I agree that the game indeed should not be considered as fun, but I'm pretty sure that the creators also did not intend the game to be annoying or tedious. Being entertained or invested is not the same as having fun. So in the subway, you eventually reunite with Cynthia again. And all that sexual tension was for naught, since she gets killed in a pretty horrific scene with numbers carved into her chest. You then wake up in your apartment again, and just as I said before, these moments are the best, where suddenly you hear sirens outside, and when you look out the window, you see that Cynthia is taken out of the subway with an ambulance. When you go to the living room, you can hear some staticky voices over the radio talking about Cynthia's corpse and the weird numbers carved into her. Afterwards, you will crawl through the hole again and get teleported to a new area each time and each time you will meet with a certain person who by the end dies a horrible death and this person then also dies in the real world as you always find out when you return to your room. This initial premise is actually really cool and interesting and has you invested and guessing where it goes. It isn't until it's very clearly that it's about Walter Sullivan that the story also starts to falter, but we will get to that in due time. So once you go back through the hole and arrive at the second world, you arrive at this forest area, and this forest area is simply very boring. It actually holds up for many of the levels in Silent Hill 4, it's that the levels are very plain and dull. The subway section in Silent Hill 3 was the weakest in my opinion, since it was just so plain looking, and of course this also holds up for the subway section in Silent Hill 4. The forest here is just not special at all, and it has you walk through various locations, talk to a stuttering guy who at a certain point blocks the path into an orphanage, and really wants something chocolatey to drink. Awfully specific, but this puzzle is actually one of the more clever ones, as you are once again required to go back to your room and get chocolate milk from your fridge. I like that they do this mechanic, where you need to go back to your own room sometimes and you interact with items or collect something in order to progress in the alternative world. I believe it's also the forest, where another new enemy type gets introduced in the form of mosquitoes. Or maybe they're moths, or mosquito bats, or whatever they are, they're annoying. Not scary, and just another terrible choice of enemy. Tiny bugs that skitter around, or are quick and annoying, are more likely than not a terrible choice as an enemy type in any game. That's why it's so good that those skittering cockroaches in Silent Hill 2 are used so sparingly. If you were to bump into them as much as you do with these stupid flying bugs in Silent Hill 4, it would be really tedious, but that's exactly what you get with this. Again, they are way faster than you, so running will get you hurt. Now, they don't do a lot of damage, but often will come in great numbers. You sometimes will find some bug spray, but if you don't have that handy, it's also such a hassle to deal with them, since you need to take them down with a shot or punch, and then stomp them to death before they come back. Their sound design is once again just stock sounds and feels cheap. One thing I forgot to mention about the fighting system is that in here they introduce a charge attack, you can charge by holding down a button to do some extra damage. The attack itself has a very long and drawn out animation, but granted you are invulnerable while doing this. Now because of this I've actually read that people think that the combat is easier or better compared to earlier Silent Hill games, but to have to keep resorting to charge attacks every single time is also just really boring and takes forever. Anyway, the stuttering guy you meet in the forest also ends up dead, which you will then hear about in the news when you are back in your room, and then it's time for the next level. Another real dull looking one with the prison. This facility is multi-layered and you are required to free a certain prisoner by spinning the circular rooms which you can do from a central hidden location. Here the game tries to do some more clever, creepy stuff with using shadows move against the wall like someone is watching through a peeping hole at the top of each cell, but it did not creep me out to the point where the mannequins did in Silent Hill 3 or the written notes by Stanley in the hospital. Probably the best enemy design of the game gets introduced in this level though, with the monkey looking twin baby heads making quite the impression when you first see them. They definitely stand out as the most unique looking and memorable, but it's a shame that they are barely a threat. I actually consider them amongst the easiest enemies since their hitboxes are so wide due to their size that you can just whack away with the weapon and it will always get stun locked and then go down. By this time I also came to the conclusion that you find a lot of different weapons you can use when it comes to melee weapons and I think that this is praiseworthy. 
Having weapons like an axe, a shovel, a golf club, or pickaxe really makes sense and are not as cartoony or stupid as the katana or mace from Silent Hill 3. So in this level you free the prisoner. He then gets killed, you go back, yada 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 yada, you get the drill by now. The next level is the building complex opposite of you where you will head to different indoor environments like a pet shop, a sporting goods store, a bar, etc. I actually really like the indoor environments in this level as they are varied and each has their own unique flavor and feel to it. The outdoor however is again just very bland and dull, but they just serve the purpose of connecting the indoor elements so I'm not putting too much on that. This level also has that cool puzzle where you need to go back to your room and check out the phone number to get through a certain door by punching in the code. The enemy type you get here are these weird looking chimpanzee enemies with testicles hanging from their necks. They are really weird and once more their sound design is just really bad as well with stock monkey sounds being used but also that same feline giant cat sound being used again that was also done with the dogs. The effect truly feels rushed and cheap in a way. So after this you go to the apartments level and this is probably the best level out of all of them. You walk around your own apartment building and can explore its three floors and pretty much all the rooms in there. Each room is decorated differently, with assets and objects complementing the one who lives there. One person is for example really into music, and so has all sorts of cassettes and tape recorders there. The other is a constant drunk, and so his apartment is full of used bottles, while another is a tech nerd, and he has all sorts of game consoles and other tech stuff laying around. There's one room that belongs to a painter, and he has paintings of all the inhabitants that can tell you something about them. This level pretty much revolves around you finding a set of red notes in different rooms and then shoving them under the door of your own apartment only to find them laying underneath when you go back to your actual room in your reality. This is very cool and clever. Though in this level sometimes does occur what I talked about with Silent Hill 2. See, Silent Hill 2 and also 3 for that matter really have that thing going where you check out 20 rooms and only 2 or 3 are open and the rest are locked. Now this can seem a bit repetitive, but it actually makes it quite clear on what you need to do or where you need to go, since at all times you only have a few select areas you can always head towards. If you are stuck, chances are likely that the answer lies in one of those three rooms you are able to go to. Silent Hill 4 kind of drops this premise in a lot of areas and you have access to way more areas than ever, and though that freedom does get appreciated, it does also happen exactly what I talked about in this apartment building, where it becomes looking for a needle in a haystack if you are missing that one final note but don't know which room you did not find it in and have to go back and search each and every single room. The fact that some of these rooms also have those incredibly dull and annoying ghost enemies does not help as you cannot properly explore and check everything since they are damaging you by simply being near you. Which actually also brings me on something I forgot to talk about with the ghosts and that is that you can find these medallions which you can put on and they will protect you temporarily from that damaging aura so you won't get hurt by ghost enemies if they are near. But you will not find many of these and they break very easily, especially for the amount of ghosts you will come across in this game in its entirety. Lastly, something does still happen in this level with the doll, which is pretty cool and unique, which I will talk about in a little bit. The level after the apartments is the hospital, and this is also just a whole bunch of awful and not in the good horror sense. You are tasked with finding Eileen here, which is locked in one of the many rooms of the hospital. You find a new type of enemy here with these giant female monsters which on first glance look pretty intimidating, but every time you hit them, they let out this burp which takes away any scariness of them. If you actually punch them down the stairs, they let out a burp with each step they fall down and it's just really hilarious. It's an initial pretty good design that falls so flat on its face by the insane sound design choice. It's also here where I just could not believe how much the creators had given up with coming up with the enemies, as the second new enemy type that gets introduced in this level are... Wheelchairs. They are ghost wheelchairs that drive around and try to hit you. And since they are ghosts, they will also hurt you by even being near you. I mean... Wheelchairs. What? How is that scary? And mind you, Silent Hill 3 does an excellent job by doing something very creepy with the wheelchair. That part where you head into a hall as Heather and you hear this wheelchair wheel spinning and slowly stopping which sounded so creepy and freaky that it gave me goosebumps. But these bumper cart pretending wheelchairs are just absolute laughing stock. What a joke these enemies are in Silent Hill 4, it's unbelievable. 
Now I won't say that the enemies from Silent Hill 2 or 3 made me crap my pants, but at least their looks and animations had so much more work and love put into them. Even the first enemy you come across in Silent Hill 2 walks so disturbingly and if you shoot them to the ground, they might skitter around like cockroaches with those horrible, horrible sounds. It's the difference of night and day with the enemy design of this game. Same with Silent Hill 3. Silent Hill 3 has those enemies with the long blades spinning and in all honesty, I thought that they seemed so threatening and intimidating that I did not want it to be anywhere near them whenever they were in a section I was at. Their sounds were also really intimidating, and it just boggles the mind how the enemies can miss the mark in this game. The twin-faced monkey thing is the best it has to offer, but all the other enemies are neither creepy nor leave an impression. The hospital is also about opening a lot of doors with items on randomized locations, meaning it's really tedious with the limited inventory system, and there's also this awful section where you enter a room where you have a giant head of Eileen looking straight at you. Though you might be startled initially, it quickly loses its creep factor when she looks cross-eyed at you if you stand in front of her. And it's again a perfect example of something that might have been good on paper, because it kind of resembles you or a reverse you of peeping through the, the peeping hole next to her, but it gets ruined by the execution. Now this is only for one of the rooms and is something that maybe lasts 10 seconds or so, so it's nothing major, but I found it ironic how the game misses its mark even with something as small as this. So it is here where you finally meet up with Eileen, and by this time, you are around halfway done with the game. Silent Hill 4 is much longer compared to Silent Hill 2 or 3, and though usually with most games, it's a good thing that it lasts longer, in this case it feels more like a curse. It's almost like a Resident Evil 6 scenario, which is also just so crap and takes so long to get through that it feels like the nightmare never stops. Now will you, this is not as long as Resident Evil 6, but I rest my case. Anyway, you meet up with Eileen and escort her to one of those holes so you can return to your own reality in the room. It's also here where the gameplay of the room takes a turn and it's a pretty cool twist and surprise. See, up until this point, you always associated the room with safety and a place to rest, save, and refill your health. But from this point onward, the room does not heal you anymore, and it slowly will become haunted. Now what kind of hauntings happen will be randomized, but all sorts of cool and creepy things can occur. You can find a dead cat in your fridge, you can find furniture stained with blood, your clock can start ticking out of control, a ghost can appear out of the wall, or your window shutters start tapping. Whenever you are close to these hauntings, your character will actually take damage, and can even die if this goes on for too long. Now the way you get rid of these hauntings is by using the candles you find in the levels that I talked about. You go near one of the hauntings, put down the candle, and the haunting will disappear. After a few visits, new hauntings will appear, but there's a lot of candles to find to where you can keep most of your apartment pretty haunting free. This is important too because it will influence the ending. Now one of the most unique and cool things I came across with the game is that there are cursed items. I use plural, but in all honesty I came across only one, so not sure if there are multiple. But at a certain point in the apartments level, you come across a man with long hair in a coat who offers a doll to you. You can choose to leave the doll or pick it up. There's no use for this item, but the item is cursed. The moment you pick up that doll, you are stuck with it. If you put the doll in the item box, a unique haunting can occur, where these little girls resembling the doll come climbing through the walls and start screaming. If you want to keep this from happening, you will have to carry the doll around with you, which means it will take up one item inventory slot. Having these cursed items is actually pretty cool as it feels like a proper consequence for the action that you took earlier. I do have to say that though I do like the hauntings, they're not that scary. That doll haunting was probably the scariest out of all of them, but most of the time it's just like having weird brown fungi on your wall or something, and it's in all honesty not all that scary or intimidating. Even that ghosts coming through the wall is the same animation you've seen a thousand times already, so that also did not scare me. Once you go back to the alternative reality through the hole, you are right back in the room where Eileen was and it turns out that she cannot travel through the holes. That means that you will have to find a different exit for her and accompany her on her journey to do so, and this is where the second half of the game begins, and it is even worse than the first half. Because the entire second half of the game is an escort mission. And I'm not talking about just 30 minutes or an hour, but multiple hours of one of the most tedious and obnoxious escorting missions you will find in gaming. 
I've actually heard someone say that this is one of the easiest escort missions you'll ever play, but that person is simply talking out of his ass. With Eileen, you go back to all of the levels you visited again, with the exception of the hospital, and you will need to escort her to the exit every single time, and it is the absolute worst. So Eileen cannot die, so if you are worried about that, don't be. But she can take damage, and the amount of damage that she takes will influence the ending. Now ironically, despite me absolutely despising and hating this entire escorting section, I got Eileen through without her having almost a bruise. I've looked at footage of other players, and with them, Eileen is all bloody and veiny, making me really wonder how they played it. See, the tedious part about escorting Eileen is not that she is taking damage, but it's all the other tedious bits that come with an escorting quest in a game. First off, Eileen is incredibly slow. If you run, she will not be able to keep up. If you are too far, she will cry out and not move from her position. It can also happen that if she is too far away from you when you enter a door, she will not come with you to the next room. So you always will have to make sure that she is near you with her snail pace, and you are just walking and walking, and even then, she sometimes still cannot keep up with you if you walk down things like stairs or something. But that is only talking about annoying sections where there are no enemies. If there are enemies, it gets so much worse. Let's say you don't want to fight too many monsters because you don't want to take damage and normally you can run past enemies. Besides that this is difficult due to the speed of the enemies in this game, now you get an extra handicap in that either Eileen will not be able to keep up with you if you try to run, or she will get stuck in this weird animation where she stops following you if the enemy is near or in the way. See, it makes sense if an enemy is between you and her that she will not run through it. But instead of going around it to keep up with you, she will sometimes just stand there in a panic and you will then need to go around the enemy yourself so she will then follow you again and it's all just a big garbage pile of frustration as you take damage in the process. You now also cannot heal in the room, so taking damage is far more serious now. Though the game does give you more healing items, it's still very annoying to deal with Eileen and her stupid malfunctioning AI. You can also find weapons for Eileen like a handbag or a nightstick. And she's actually pretty competent and strong with that. She will attack enemies and if you team up, you can take down even the most annoying and quick dogs pretty easily. But she will also automatically attack ghosts, which cannot die, and so she can become stuck in this stupid attacking animation against an enemy that cannot die, whereas I just want to run away and get to the next room while this bitch is still attacking the ghost. And this of course only happens if she has the weapon equipped, and so if you remove the weapon from her hand, she does become more inclined to follow you. But then, you still have an awful AI that stops and panics if the enemy or ghost is near. Honestly, this is literally one of the worst escort quests I've ever seen in gaming. It's true that mostly the escort quest in gaming gets despised because you have to keep someone alive. But here is just everything else that comes with it except that one aspect. For me, Eileen also got stuck on the terrain four times, even when there were no enemies and I was not sprinting. Now, as I said, with Eileen, you now will go back and revisit all the worlds you've been to, and this once again makes the game feel cheap and amateurish. There are games out there where they reuse levels and it feels earned. The Kingdom Hearts games are a good example of this, where you visit each world twice, but the second time is drastically different with new areas to explore, new enemies to fight, but also the story going deeper since bonds with characters or lore have already been established during the first visit. Here it just feels cheap, since you are not visiting any new environments and just retrace your steps to all the rooms and hallways you already know. Now in each of these levels you will encounter a new type of ghost. Yippee. More ghost type enemies. The one enemy type I did not think we needed more of. Now I will say that the thought behind these ghost appearances is pretty cool, with them being the victims that died during your initial visits. These ghosts are also stronger and more unique than the other ones and even appear in later levels as well. One is of course Cynthia, who will grab you with her long hair and is very clearly inspired by ghostly figures from movies like The Ring. The other ghost is one that is on fire, the other guy is fat, and then the last one can teleport. I talked about the swords briefly in this review, and these swords are items which if you stick them in a ghost when they are down, they will not get back up. But you can only find four or five of these, so they are very scarce. 
Now, though you can also use them on the random ghosts you come across in the levels, you are kind of supposed to use them on these more unique ghosts, since if you don't, there will be sections that will be hella annoying, especially with you trying to escort Eileen to a certain door. I had one room I had to go through with two ghosts in it, of which one was the Ringu-like ghost, and I had the most difficult time to get Eileen to follow me and not panic, and then also not to attack the ghost, and me not taking damage, and it was just an absolute nightmare. Even during this annoying escort section, you still do have fun gameplay with going back to the room and using items to solve puzzles. With one, you find a dirty coin you need to wash in your own sink, and the other is a shirt with wax on top, which you need to drip in a pool of blood in your tub. The levels do get a bit more gimmicky, which is fun initially, but get ruined because of the whole escort matter. The forest level, which is still quite dull, gets actually a lot better, since you are now tasked with finding parts of a doll to make it whole and reveal the path ahead. You will need to grab a torch and search for wells in the level you already know, which is cool and does make it feel a bit new. But with Eileen, it's just a pain. Same goes for the level with the bar in the pet shop, where you need to find four different items like a volleyball or snooker ball and need to put them back in the places they belong. It's cool because you pick up these items and think, hmm, where does this belong? Where did I see a pool table? Or where was there a birthday cake for me to put candles in? It's a neat little thing and has you thinking, but ta-da, having Eileen makes it worse again. It's also at this time where at certain points you will get stalked by that guy with the long hair and the coat. This guy is also a ghost and thus invincible, but he has a gun and a pretty powerful melee attack. First off, this ghost just looks like a regular man so it's also not creepy or scary at all, not even when he has his dumb laugh. It's just like the other ghost just incredibly annoying as you just want to run away from him since he's invincible, but Eileen will not be able to keep up, meaning you might take damage or she will get stuck or panicked etc. In tight and narrow sections like the apartments or the circular stairs in the prison, it's just the worst since the ghost might actually block her entire path and you are forced to stand next to her to have you follow again and take damage in the process. And let's also now actually talk a little bit about who this guy is and what he has to do with the story because the story of Silent Hill 4 kind of revolves around him. You see, where the initial premise of Silent Hill 4 seems very promising, it kind of keeps crashing down once you find out who it revolves around and what his motivations are. So basically, the murders you witness and the numbers that are carved in the bodies have to do with a character called Walter Sullivan. Walter Sullivan is a mass murderer who was born in the apartment room you are staying at and was abandoned by his parents. He was then brought to an orphanage in Signed Hill and was brainwashed. He started to believe that apartment room 302, that's Henry's room, is his mother. Let me repeat this. Walter started to believe that apartment room 302 was his mother. What? That is the most outrageous and dumbest thing I have heard in a long time. Thinking that a room is your mom? Each Silent Hill game, even the later ones, which are apparently worse than this, have strong themes running through it. I, of course, talked about the themes of Silent Hill 2 and 3 in those reviews, but here, there's a very clear link with birth, since you see umbilical cords in all the levels, and in the enemy design, like the hospital women, with wounds in their stomachs where a baby should be. Now, in essence, the premise of a baby being abandoned by its parents and what sort of childhood trauma or stress that could result in is something very interesting and worth exploring. But to then come to the result that it thinks that a room is its mother is just the dumbest and most ridiculous way to handle this. Silent Hill 2, with its theme of people's lives getting destroyed who suffer together with the one being terminally ill, is something so real and relevant to discuss in our reality. But this premise of a person believing a room is its mom is just way out there and more ridiculous than it needs to be. Anyway, so besides Walter believing that room 302 is its mommy, he started killing all these people because he was performing a ritual of the 21 sacraments for the descent of the Holy Mother. He believed he would get his mother back and be reunited with her, while in reality the town's cult would get their wish of actually the devil, or god, depending on how you look at it, descending down and once again creating paradise like they have always yearned for. Each victim is chosen for a specific theme, with Cynthia being chosen for temptation, Eileen being kindness, and Henry being wisdom, because, well, Henry is just oozing all that smartness. So, yeah, it's all about him wanting to reunite with his mother. 
thinking that the room is his mom and oh yeah, I forgot too to say that Walter Sullivan is actually dead and it's his ghost that is continuing the killing. Honestly, people talk about how Silent Hill 4 has some of the best storytelling in the series, and though I agree that the setup and the premise during those first four levels is very promising, it eventually leads to nothing but disappointment and an anticlimax. Then there's the fact that the character in and of itself is Walter Sullivan, is something that I find annoying personally, but now I will admit that I will be nitpicking a bit. See, if you have not played Silent Till 2, you might not know who Walter Sullivan is, and the whole history will go right over your head, and so you will play a pretty interesting story with just a very weird twist and conclusion. However, the name Walter Sullivan was introduced in Silent Till 2 in a really well-written article. In this news article, it is talked about how Walter Sullivan killed a couple of kids in a really gruesome way. A schoolmate of Walter is being interviewed, and he talked about how Walter said weird things like, and I quote, He is trying to kill me, trying to punish me. The monster, the red devil, forgive me, I did it, but it wasn't me. Now there's a lot of things to unpack here. First off, the fact that he is talking about the red devil, as he is referring to Pyramid Head, as he is also known as the red devil. Now there's no mention to my belief of Pyramid Head inside Silent Hill 4, though in the end you do find a sketchbook with, I, which I guess a guy with a triangular head on it that says that it's his father, but that notion that Walter thinks Pyramid Head is his dad is even more ridiculous. If that were the case, I might think they might want to link it to the parental abuse or the fact that the father wanted to abandon the child or something. But the function of Pyramid Head in Silent Hill 2 is to punish. It does so for James, and Sullivan is also talking about this in the news article. Then also the article stated that Sullivan said that he did it, but it wasn't him. Now this does not sound like someone who is willingly killing all these people in order to resurrect his mommy, huh? This is honestly one of the most annoying aspects of the game, but one that is very personal, and again kind of a nitpick, because those who have not played Silent Hill 2, nor have gone as deep in the lore, would really care. It really feels ham-fisted and forced to use a minor character from Silent Hill 2 and try to expand on its history and story, which then, in the end, really falls flat. In Silent Hill 2, it's also stated that Sullivan committed suicide in jail, but of course Silent Hill 4 does the dumb thing that sequels often do in both movies and games, where they retcon it and it turns out that the dead guy, who they thought was Sullivan, actually is not Sullivan! One of the reasons why I find that also just a dumb statement is because there's a really creepy and subtle moment in Silent Hill 2 where you arrive at this weird graveyard with graves for James, the character you play as, and the other two side characters you meet but also a grave with Walter Sullivan's stone on it. Meaning he is buried there too, and had its death due to the mysteries of Silent Hill. If it's indeed like they say in Silent Hill 4 where Sullivan actually did not commit suicide, it means that the entities that B within Silent Hill made a mistake by having a closed grave there because the cursed town actually did not result in his death. If his grave was already open in Silent Hill 2, then it would have been a bit more leadway to introduce this story. They actually have this in the forest level in Silent Hill 4, where they show the open grave of Sullivan, but like I said, they did not do this in 2, and so all the choices and story bits with Sullivan feel so forced and almost like fanfiction in a way. It's like you take a very minor character from a movie or show and then write a whole backstory about them which doesn't add anything to the main plot whatsoever. It's just so you have an excuse to link it to earlier titles. I honestly think that if it was not Walter Sullivan, but a whole new character, that it would have been better. So yeah, if they had picked any other character or just someone new and told this same story, it would not have bothered me as much. I just would have laughed at the thought of it seeing the room as its mommy. But that would be that. Also, the notion of going through the holes and the holes appearing refers to a phrase in Silent Hill 2 where you head to a cafe and it says in bloody letters on the wall, there was a hole here, it's gone now. It was one of the weirdest and most unexplained things about Silent Hill 2, and the fact that this game now wants to link it with that is also a bit ridiculous. And no, I do not believe the theory that back then they already had in their mind to make a future game where you travel through these holes. Basically, since we are coming to the end of the video, I'm skipping ahead a little bit in the end, where you find out that one of your walls in your room is actually the remaining dead body of Walter Sullivan nailed to an iron cross. This genuinely freaked me out and was the second time that the game gave me goosebumps. It's really effective and visually a scary image and it's a shame that it's so near the end for it to happen. 
After this, you have one final boss battle, which though visually pretty cool, it's just also annoying with Walter Sullivan having incredible amounts of health, and I pretty much beat him by then exploiting that stupid invincibility time whenever you do a charge attack. It's also during this battle that Eileen becomes possessed, and will slowly walk towards the center of the room filled with blood and that thing from Event Horizon. If you fail to kill Walter before she steps in, you will get one of the worst endings, and the speed at which she walks towards it is linked to how many times she got attacked during the second half of the game. For some reason, I did very well with her, despite absolutely hating it, so for me, she barely moved. I also should mention that I played it on normal difficulty. And that was even before I knew that you were able to cure her of these wounds with one of the candles, which I found out after I had beaten the game. You then get one of the four endings and turns out that I got the best ending where Henry is finally free and visits Eileen as they might move in together or find a place to stay together or whatever and I just don't care. I was so glad that I was done with this stupid game. Playing this game now gave me a first taste of the decline of what Silent Hill has become. Though I knew that this game was divisive, I knew that there also was a group who liked it. But after playing this, I cannot understand why, let alone stating that this is their favorite Silent Hill game in the series. And oh yes, there are actually people who say that, and I assume they are the same who think Jurassic Park 3 is the best of Jurassic Park trilogy, or who think Hannibal Rising is better than Signs of the Lambs. But jokes aside, Silent Hill 4 was so much of a disappointment for me after the brilliance of Silent Hill 2 and 3. For every step of interesting thing that Silent Hill 4 introduces, it takes two steps back with stupid enemy design horrible controls, terrible mechanics like the escort mission, or just laughably bad plot writing or audio. The best part of the entire game, and where I truly, truly had fun, were the sections in your own room in first person. But these sections are so brief, you are only there two or three minutes at a time, and in total you probably spend somewhere between 30 to 40 minutes in a game that is over 7 hours. I've read a few people's arguments on why they like Silent Hill 4 so much, or why it's their favorite, and for multiple people they talk about how it's just the scariest or creepiest out of all the Silent Hill games. Fear of course is subjective. I find dolls very scary, so games or movies about dolls would scare me way more than one about ghosts. But those movies are of course very scary to people who are scared of ghosts, whereas they would laugh at movies I find scary about dolls. Where the ghost enemies, for example, do not creep me out at all, there's a good chance that they will creep out someone else. The scares or hauntings in the apartment don't work for me, but they might work for someone else. The creepiest parts to me personally is when something visually very disturbing was there in a location where previously there was nothing like the mannequin on the toilet. Or the hanged up Sullivan in my wall. But even if the game would creep me out, the annoying mechanics of combat and lazy enemy design and that awful escort second half would just really kill the enjoyment and investment I would have with this game. There are some people who call Silent Hill 4 daring, or even high art, but in my honest opinion, people who say that are just pretentious idiots. Again, many people who defend this game say that people hate it purely because the creators did things different, but I hope that with this review I explained why those other things simply don't work. It's absolutely true that when creators change the formula, that they take a chance, they take risks, and it should be commendable for them wanting to do things differently. But in this case, those new systems and mechanics just don't work well, and that is the reason not to like it. Not because it's not like the earlier games. Resident Evil 4 is one of the most beloved games in the series, and that is really different compared to Resident Evil 1, 2, and 3. All in all, I cannot recommend Silent Hill 4. The few really cool moments get overshadowed by too much crap, and in the end, Silent Hill 4 gets a 6.2. Those awesome room sections are the only reason it stays afloat above a 6, and if it were only for the third person gameplay, it would have scored way below that 6. Now many people seem to agree that almost all the games after Silent Hill 4 are garbage, and since I have not played any of them, I cannot formulate one opinion about that. I do know one thing, and that's that this Silent Hill entry left a bad taste in my mouth, and I did not like it. Therefore, I will probably not play Downpour or Homecoming, since according to so many, it's even worse. But I will take a look at Silent Hill Shattered Memories, since if I'm not mistaken, there is actually quite a big fan base who says that that is one of the games that is still pretty good after Silent Hill 1, 2, and 3. But Silent Hill 4 will keep its room door closed, and luckily for me, I never plan on opening it again.